Hey everyone, Matt Batman here. One year ago, the amazing Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came out on the Nintendo Switch. Though sadly, I had to wait a week because Target is annoying and delayed my copy. Anyways, I made this compilation to celebrate the one year anniversary. Whenever I go back to see my video on the base game, I find myself cringing at my poor editing skills. I mean, it's not that hard to tune the audio, but whatever. I was planning on making a wholly new video focused on another look at Xenoblade Chronicles 3 with my updated thoughts and with Future Redeemed too. This video was scrapped because I'm busy working on my Tears of the Kingdom review, but I still hope that you enjoy this video. Anyways, let's head into the video. This video has spoilers for the mainline Xenoblade Chronicles franchise alongside each expansion. Proceed with caution. In 2010, Xenoblade Chronicles was released in Japan and eventually it would receive critical acclaim from both critics and fans alike, calling it one of the best JRPGs of that generation. From there onwards, a franchise would be born with a sequel, a spin-off, a remaster, and even three fighters in Super Smash Bros. Is this Xenoblade? Looks like an RPG. Fighting in order to live, and living to fight. Is this the Blade Chronicles X? That's the way of our world. I might be the new thing for models. Ionios. <laughs> Tell me, what would possess you oh, to shit. side with them? Oh, We're fighting because there are enemies oh, here. Oh, I refuse oh, to believe you're him. Ever since the announcement trailer released in the February Nintendo Direct, I've been extremely excited for this game. At this point, this game was looking like the best Xenoblade Chronicles game yet. The art style was stylized like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but had more realistic body proportions, making the characters look even better than ever before. I was so excited that I screamed and my father had to check up on me to see if I was okay. I had finished Xenoblade Chronicles 2 last year, and I loved it so much, and I wanted to see what the future held for the future of the two worlds. Currently, this had surpassed my expectations in every way, and even then, it fulfilled ideas and concepts that I had no idea that I would ever want. Xenoblade 3's battle themes are stuck in my head. So good, man! I love flutes! Let me buy them, Nintendo! Xenoblade Chronicles 3, the world that you're going to explore is called Ionios, and it's the mashup of the worlds from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. The worlds from both of these games were already really exciting to explore, with beautiful set pieces like Satoru Marsh, Fallen Arm, Urea, and Tantal. And to see these elements reused for this game, it was looking amazing. One of the developers for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 that worked on this game mentioned that the areas for this game were five times as bigger than Xenoblade 2's Titans. And holy shit, he wasn't lying. The world of Ionios is one of my favorite areas of all of gaming to explore. And since there's no loading times in the regions themselves, it makes exploring that much better. Yeah, I get that feeling of X, of just exploring the world and the gameplay of it a lot more than the other two. The world has so much to explore, just like X did. Exploring is highly recommended because you will miss a lot if you don't. There's also more to do now compared to the previous games. There are camps around the world that allow you to clean clothes, have a discussion, use gems, and cook food. It's an evolution of Torner's camp system, and I love it. You can find different hero quests all throughout the story and through the world, and they feel so much more natural and story related than ever before. Some of these hero quests even tie into the main game and with party members, so it makes them feel that much better. If you go off the beaten path in the story, you'll find new hero quests and that's awesome and that's what makes exploration really good in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. The stories that you find by choosing the hero quests are unique and amazing and the heroes that you find, they're also really cool. Heroes like Ethel, Zeon, Isert, and Grey, they're all so cool and unique all with their own backstories and with likable personalities. A new feature that can be found around Ionios is called Skirmishes. In Skirmishes, you choose one of two sides to get a unique reward. This helps make the world feel more natural because there are bound to be animals fighting each other for food, resources, or for territory. Plus, these can help with leveling up classes and colony affinities. And coming from the viral sensation Fortnite are airdrops. 
Periodically, there will be an airdrop from either Keves or Agnes that gives you cool supplies. It helps the world feel more like it's actually in war. And thankfully, Secret Air is returned, and they are beautiful and amazing. I won't show any here to, due to me being lazy, but please believe me. There's this one secret area in the Fornus region, and it actually reuses a secret area from Xenoblade Chronicles 1, and I almost felt nostalgic. A Xenoblade X reference? Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is a standalone experience where you don't need to play the other games to enjoy this one, but I highly recommend you do because otherwise you're giving yourself a disservice. Plus, the other games are really, really good with amazing stories. And if you're playing this without playing the others, then you're gonna lose a lot of references, especially with the party members that you play as. And when we first saw Mio, we all thought that she was Nia. Noah's sword looks really similar to the Monado, but evolved. And Lon's, of course, is a lot like Ryan from Xenoblade Chronicles, but now Machina. Oh yeah, baby! Yuni's like a combination of Sharla, Melia, and Nia. Arts in the game were also taken from the previous two games, such as Shadow Eye, Ray of Punishment, Blossom Dance, and others. And how could I forget Ashera? By the way, the best here in the game. She's like, she's a descendant of Sharla, obviously, but she has the arts from Dumb Man. And it's really cool to see these previous references, because I've been playing Xenoblade Chronicles 2 again and again after I beat it. In the world itself, you'll notice so many references, and it's made me squeal so many times seeing a familiar landmark. This is honestly a huge reason to play the previous two games. You won't understand or enjoy these references as much as if you haven't played these games before. It's amazing exploring the Erythian Sea and seeing landmarks from the past, seeing the Makana Sword, Urea, and landmarks from the Bayan Shoulder and others are a real treat. It's also just really interesting seeing these new areas remixed or just giving a new facelift. But Xenoblade 3, I think more than any other, really emphasizes you to analyze and look at previous scenes in a much different viewpoint, taking into account everything you know and putting together pieces based on all of the vague clues the game, the game uh, throws out. If you've looked at anything from like Mixed Channel or anything like that, you'll see that there's a lot of little things that you can theorize about and even put together from from hints on there. Come on, come on, come on! That's enough! You're just gonna break your hands. I don't care! I'll shatter every bone in my body! If that's what it takes! Just stop! Please! Neo! Uh, are you okay? I really liked Xenoblade 3. The story was, well, what can I say? It was Xenotier as always. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 offers a robust story with an engaging opening to this game, similar to Xenoblade Chronicles on the original Wii. In fact, this game has a lot of similarities to the previous games. In the world of Ionios, there is a constant war between two nations. This by itself replicates the original Xenoblade Chronicles, since in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, it was the Mechonis versus the Bionis. Similar to Xenoblade Chronicles 2, the world of Ionios always has to worry about their future. It's not stable, and they have to fight in order to live. The story of Ouroboros freeing the world from his shackles is one of the most engaging stories in the franchise, even if it doesn't really develop a lot during the middle parts of the story. One of the best parts of any of the Xenoblade Chronicles games was the ending of Chapter 5. You know, I thought our lives were like our music, always in our hands, under our control. I wasn't facing the truth. Even if I could reach people, I wouldn't be able to save them. should have known that. It's unbearable seeing life slip away from you. Even though they're right there. What am I even doing? 
I and probably many other players thought that Mio's story would be cut short and that she would be sent into a homecoming and that she would never be reincarnated ever again. I tried to hold out hope until the very end, but it was too late. Her homecoming was complete and she won't be reincarnated. Noah's voice actor Harry McIntyre had a fantastic performance here, and even at the beginning of this game, you could tell it was better than the entirety of Zimplay Chronicles 2. His performance helped me to love the story even more, and to get me truly engrossed in the story of Aeolios. Getting back to the actual story, we had the best possible outcome. Mio had survived in Consul M's body. Does that mean I am the two of you? So the one who died is <gasps> this time for real. What in the actual Xeno fuck? Holy shit, holy shit. Xenoblade Chronicle 3's story is so good because it respects your time by jumping straight into the action and by not bogging down the story of the beginning. It also doesn't mess with moments by taking a joke too far. A problem that many had with Xenoblade Chronicles 2's story is that people had issues with the light-hearted moments after a difficult battle or just it feeling out of place. Mithra is sleeping next to Rex by accident. And it's not handled well at all. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 handles these moments much, much better. Characters talk about certain topics in the overworld or during cutscenes, and it makes these situations feel better without releasing the tension. The problem with Xenoblade Chronicles 1's combat is that it's easy to learn but not that fun to play with. The problem with Xenoblade Chronicles 2's gameplay is that it's hard to learn but it's so much fun to play with. Naturally, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is hard to learn and not fun to play. Kidding aside, the gameplay in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is the best in the franchise and it's really, really good. Monolith Soft has done a fantastic job perfecting the gameplay and making it so much better. The combat is a mix of the previous game. It's mainly based off of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but depending on the country's class, your arts are going to recharge differently. Also like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you have a lot of different playstyles, but what makes them unique? Instead of blades, we now have heroes. And in my opinion, it's much better than the blade system. Each hero is unique with 5 arts and special skills that help out in the battle. In order to use arts on the d-pad, you have to equip a hero's class, and by wrecking up a class, you earn their arts and skills. As much as I love Nia and Mio, I think my favorite Xenoblade cat person has to be Juniper. They're green, they're a nihilist, but most importantly, they're just cute. The only catch to this is that you can only set your master arts to be the opposite country of the current class. After arts of both countries are charged, you can fuse them together in order to form a powerful fusion art, and this is what raises your interlink level. Ouroboros is another key feature of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, and we'll talk about that later. Something that I've been wanting ever since I played Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is the ability to freely change between party members during battle. And the amazing thing is, you don't have to wait to recharge at all, so if there's something specific you want to do in battle, you can do it yourself. The only downside to this is that if your AI companions already use some arts, those will still be recharging. The best part about this is that you don't have to stress about anything. If you want to stick to just one character in a fight, you can do that. Also, I forgot to mention there's not just four, not five, not six, but seven active party members on the field at all times. Seven. That is insane. And performance during battle feels on par or even better than Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And we all know how bad it got. This mechanic really helps me use all my party members during battle, so I just... It's helpful making me appreciate all of them more. If there's one thing I had to complain about all of this is that I'm not a fan of the recharge system due to Kevis Arts refilling over time. It worked in Xenoblade Chronicles 1 due to you having 16 active arts at a time. Here it just makes combat feel a bit slower.
The Ouroboros mechanic introduced in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is an extremely fun feature in battle that lets you use arts without needing to charge them, and plus these arts are really, really good. Ouroboros don't take damage during battle, instead have a heat gauge that rises over time. At the start of battles, your Ouroboros isn't going to be strong at all since it's at level 0. You're going to have to level it up using fusion arts. If you stick to level 0, your arts and attacks will be really weak. And if you go all... And if you go to level 3, you're going to get really powerful arts with new abilities, like breaking all the enemies or dazing all the enemies. Noah's Ouroboros gets a special talent art that activates when you're going to overheat, and you get this after Chapter 5's ending. In order to fully maximize your Ouroboros, you're going to have to visit your soul tree in the menu. This allows you to raise your Ouroboros stats, gain new abilities, arts, and even enhance your arts, making them even stronger. In Xenoblade Chronicles 3, chain attacks are the best thing ever due to it combining elements from the previous chain attacks we've seen before in Xenoblade Chronicles, and adding its own spin on the formula. From Xenoblade Chronicles 1, party members use their own arts to attack. From Future Connected, you choose a special attack at the beginning of a turn to do a special move. And from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you can extend the turns and have Overkill, which is amazing for grinding. The way you extend turns this time is different from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Every party member has a different TP value at the beginning of each chain attack. And the way you extend the turns is that you have to get the TP meter to over 100%. The higher the TP meter is past 100%, the more party members you get back. This new mechanic makes chain attacks that much more better. Plus, the music for the chain attacks is amazing. Please fix the chain attack theme playing when it shouldn't. Please. There are a lot of complaints surrounding Xenoblade Chronicles 2, mainly regarding quality of life issues, poor UI, and terrible, and terrible tutorials. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 had controlled tutorials on the fucking D-pad, and tutorials disappeared after viewing them once. The game didn't tell you anything, and I can, and I can understand why people found the game boring. Oh, and also Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was rushed, which is, which is evident. The voice acting is awkward at times, there wasn't a skip travel button at launch. Auto run returns as well, thankfully. And now you just have to click on the left analog stick, which works which works well most of the time, and it makes sense. The UI is improved, as you can see, with it improving the look, especially in the menus and in battle. It's stylized and it looks really good. You can also quickly change classes for all the party members, and the chibi characters for the classes are really, really cute. Other quality of life improvements in this game that make playing the game even better are collectibles with actual models, fighting in water, and a route that tells you exactly where to go. Not using it allows for more exploration, but sometimes it can be difficult knowing where to go. It's like Xenoblade Chronicle Definitive Edition's version, but improved and it makes sense story-wise. The villains for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 are incredibly disappointing. Except for console and NM, but we'll talk about them later. The main villain for this title is bland and uninteresting. The design is immaculate and beautiful, but Zed doesn't stand at all compared to Malos, or even Zanza. Zed's more of a concept, but even then Zed isn't developed at all and the party members don't even meet him. As for the villains, I think a lot of them could have been condensed into a few recurring characters instead of all doing their own thing, but I do think there are more good ones than most people. Finally, my thoughts on Zed. I actually really liked him, and I didn't expect to see so many people bashing him when I went back online after beating the game. There are a few factors for this, but it was mainly because of him being a chess master villain, my favorite type of villain, on top of his design and his boss fight's length, which is something I'd wanted from Xenoblade for a while. I also really liked how a lot of his scenes contain what seemed to me to be references to Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. I'd say the most clear instance of this is the theater scene where N finally accepts the power of Mobius, which seems to call back to the Darth Plagueis scene from Revenge of the Sith. In addition to this, I also appreciated the Xenogears reference in his final phase. If you know, you know. Anyway, that's all from me. Malos is pure evil and will do anything to destroy the world he lives in. The difference is that he has a compelling backstory. Zed does not. Mobius and General weren't threatening at all in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. 
You always manage to beat them in the main story without any hitches, and their designs for the most part are just... goofy. The only Mobius that were interesting to me were D, N, and N. They all had very cool parts to the story and felt interesting. Oh! And also Trident was also cool as a Mobius that actually joined your party. Talking about N and M, they were fantastic. You learned during Mio's homecoming that N was a Noah that tried to rise up, but he failed. He lost everything. But Zed gave him a chance. The chance to become Mobius and to get back Mio. N is tyrannical. Even Noah admitted that given the circumstances, his path would have been the same. Hell, even I would have done the same if there was someone I loved that much. After a kiss that I got spoiled on, it's finally time. It's time for the worlds to merge. The song Monolith Soft uses here is fantastic and emotional. It might be my favorite in the series. I may have had a lot of issues in Xenoblade Chronicles 3, but this ending cutscene reminded me of my love for Xenoblade Chronicles. In my opinion, this was a fantastic way to cap off the saga. You can tell that all of these games were made with love and attention. They all tell their own stories, and even if there's some messy moments in each title, this will go down, at least in my opinion, as one of the best stories of all of gaming. After 20 years after the failed Xenogears, Tetsuya Takahashi has finally fulfilled his lifelong dream to tell the story of Perfect Works. I'm excited to see what the future of Xenoblade Chronicles holds, and what stories we can get in this new world, or in another universe. This isn't the end of Xenoblade Chronicles. This is the end of the Claw Saga. Today, we use our power to fell a god, and then seize our destiny! Why are you the masters, and we the slaves? These are our lives here! They're not some toys you can just play with! You really don't remember us at all. Fiora, listen! If nothing else, you must remember your family. That's Dunban over there! The world's never gonna change! If that's all you got! Doing it for myself. If it helps put smiles on people's faces, helps them live their lives together, then that's my role in this world! We need to find a way forward within that world! Still, even if we're worlds apart, I swear I won't. I won't let go. Not ever. I'll always be with you. Our feelings forever interlinked. In this world, there are so many mingled desires. But do we? Does anyone have the right to choose? Z-Blade Chronicles 3 was amazing. It was a perfect game for me. It added a ton of new gameplay ideas, a story that I loved for the most part, and a satisfactory conclusion to a 12 year old long saga. Ever since Z-Blade Chronicles 2 launched back in 2017, the franchise has dabbled with story expansions that expand on some characters and a new story. For the original Z-Blade Chronicles, we have Future Connected that expands on the character of Melia and the future of the franchise. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 got a prequel known as Torna, the Golden Country, that looks back 500 years before Torna was destroyed, and would expand on the characters of Mithra, Malos, and Jin. So, what does Future Redeemed expand on? What does it improve? Well, for starters, we get the Gigachad Rex who now wields two Aegis Swords. We also get protagonists named Matthew, and I'm a Matthew. I'll be completely honest, for everything that I loved about Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I felt that the story was the worst in the trilogy, namely with the third act where chapter 6 and 7 felt rushed and underwhelming, other than the ending. The villains were a huge step down for me with only Anne and Dirk being enjoyable. 
Seablet grapples too at some fantastic antagonists, with Malice and Jin being nearly perfect. Z, on the other hand, is just there. He's a mastermind behind Origin, but that's just really it. The game doesn't expand on him, and it's the biggest problem of the base game. So, what does Future redeem to solve these issues? Well, in order to fully understand everything, we need to start from the beginning. The game opens up to Shulk and Rex and Z, fighting against Alvis as he seems to be causing a cataclysmic event. Eventually, it proves too much and later on we find out that this causes Rex to lose his eye and Shulk to lose his arm. The story of Future Redeemed is one that's set in the middle of everything. It's not at the beginning of Ionios, it's set in the middle before the events of the base game. It's also set in the middle of Ionios. Mobius and Z aren't major parts of the story, and instead there are other issues. While the story of Future Redeemed is quite simple and won't have you rethinking the story of the base game like Torna did, it works as it gives fans closure to characters we wanted to see and hear from after all the things that have happened. Even just seeing them reconnecting with their children despite them unaware of that fact is enough to make XD3 feel like it meant something, which was sorely lacking beforehand. So, in Future Redeemed, the antagonist is Alvis. At this point, my biggest question is, why is he antagonistic? Why is he against us? He's mad that Shulk broke up with him. Nah. Later on, we find out that he wants to end Ionius. That's not so bad, right? So why- Not a visited delusion. It is common among the old. Wholly unnecessary for all subsequent life. Oh. I'll skip ahead to the most important part of the story, and it's a part that I liked the most. On Prison Island, Matthew's fighting against N, and he realizes the truth behind the city's destruction. It wasn't because of N, but it was because of Gondor's choice to save Nael. In general, the story of Future Redeemed helps a lot to make N a more enjoyable antagonist, and I already loved him a lot in the base game. Are you really? That much of an idiot! N just takes it. Eventually, Origin blasts N, and the entire party heads into Origin. And oh my gosh, we're in the original world. A world before Kloss's experiment. Holy shit, this is the big what the fuck moment I want to see this entire time. In addition, we also get a radio that dumps a lot of lore that heavily hints towards the story connection between Xenosaga and Xenoblade Chronicles. We get a name drop, a logo, and even copyright in the copyright sections. I can't wait for all this to lead to an eventual trilogy remaster. Hey! It's not impossible. Batten Kaidos 1 and 2 are getting remastered first, and they're nowhere near as popular as Xenosaga. Though that is saying a lot, since Xenosaga wasn't exactly the most well known when it released. Finally, it's time to face off against the man himself, Alpha. Alpha's first phase isn't anything special, but it's his next phase in form that truly gets the ball running. Alpha turns into this huge... I don't know what to call it. It looks a lot like Persona 5 Royale's final boss, and that's why it's stuck in my head. At the end, N unleashes a power that finally allows the founders to defeat Alpha. They finally unleash the potential of Ouroboros, and they all combine together to become this huge Ouroboros form that's so sick. I was always disappointed that they never did this in the base game, so it's awesome to see it here. In the end, I'm satisfied with the story. It's not as emotional as the mainline titles or as Torna, but it works for what it's accomplishing. Seemly 3 was about heading into the future, whereas Future Redeemed was setting up for the future. It works, and I'm happy about that. Except for the part where Z doesn't get expanded at all. He still sucks. Fuck you, Monolith Soft. Hi, my name is Laszlo. And I just popped in to talk about the prequelness of Future Redeemed. Prequels are a very interesting topic. At the base level, a prequel tells a story that takes place before the events of the original story. When creating a prequel, you have to make sure the new story doesn't contradict the original, and most importantly, you have to make it for a reason. Say you make a story that starts with a character trying to change the world, and throughout the story they do story things, and by the end they succeed and change the world. Now, let's say you want to make a prequel to this story, for some reason or other. Do the events of the prequel matter to the original story? If the prequel takes place in the same universe, how does this new prequel fit into the story of the original? Why are they telling us this story? If it takes place before the original material, why do we need to know what happens at this point in time, when we already know how this story ends up? To put simply, why? Why are you making a prequel? Xenoblade Chronicles 3 manages to have a perfectly crafted answer to each of these questions. Future Redeemed on its own is a great story, and I'm sure you have learnt or are going to learn why in other parts of this video. But Future Redeemed gets a gold star because of how it works as a prequel. The story of Future Redeemed attempts to tell the players why things are the way that they are and why it matters that they're that way. 
The world of Ionios is a very complex place that has so many different aspects that go unmentioned, mentioned but not extrapolated, referenced but never explained, and in general leaves a lot up to the imagination. Not that the missing information in the base game would fundamentally change how the original story is meant to be interpreted. The information that's missing is all just a bunch of lore or past events that are inconsequential to the main story. All that information is just interesting. Might not be important, but it's really interesting. How was the city created? What happened to the Trinity processors, Numa, Logos, Ontos? Knowing N and M had a child, what did that child grow up to be? None of these questions are crucial to understanding the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, but I would love to know the answer to them. Future Redeemed gives us new information that is important, but not necessary to understanding how the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came to be. The reason Future Redeemed is a good story is because it's a good story, but Future Redeemed is a good prequel because it fits so well into the world of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I'm feeling full of beans! I think I found the perfect protagonist in the entire Xeno series. Matthew is hot, strong, and he's named Matthew. Matthew's a very different protagonist compared to Noah. His muscles are bigger, he's rash, and he doesn't think at all, letting him into peculiar situations. A comes in and they're quite mysterious. They're a counterpart for Matthew and have to take care of Matthew when he uses fists instead of his brain. When the trailer released, there were so many theories and questions we had surrounding A. He had a lot of similarities with Alvis, with both having gray hair, the red Aegis core, and both being cute. In Future Redeemed, Matthew is a great grandson of Noah, or technically Clay Ann right now. Instead of using a sword, Matthew instead uses gauntlets and fights in a manner similar to Fei Fong Wong from Xenogears. While I haven't beaten Xenogears myself, it's not hard to see all the similarities between the two characters. In Future Redeemed, Matthew is searching for his sister, Nael, a cat girl that has a strong visual similarity to Nia's beta design from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Later on in the story, we find out that Nael gets a sick new outfit that reminds me a lot of the original Monado. Since Alvis is an Aegis similar to Pyra and Mithra, A is actually a fragment of Alvis, and is his conscience. I found myself to adore A, and they became one of my favorite characters in the entire franchise. A's relationship with Matthew was hilarious, and their sassy but caring attitude towards Matthew helped to make this duo a joy to watch. So, Glimmer and Nicole. These two characters remind me a lot of two other characters, though... Oof, who are they? Well, I got nothing. Glimmer and Nicole are the two party members introduced shortly after Matthew and A are introduced into the story. They're both soldiers of their nations of Agnes and Kevis, respectively, and both of their colonies were fighting before Matthew took a stop to it with his gauntlets. And by the way, the way that he broke up their fighting is hilarious as well. I told you to cut it out! Yeah, and you! So, who's Nicole? Well, he's a blonde haired mechanic who can't seem to draw his own blade, so he has to rely on his own brain, and he actually made his own robotic backpack, which is really cool. Nicole's also incredibly similar to Shulk, design-wise away. They're both nerds, they both love tinkering, and they're both awkward. He's definitely Shulk and Fiora's son since he's identical to Kid Shulk and he has his mother's green eyes. There's this one moment in particular that I found adorable and it made me love Nicole and Shulk's dynamic. Glimmer wields a uniquely made spear that doubles as a fire shell, which is... This is so cool, Monosoft. We need more instruments of mass destruction. Please. Glimmer isn't at all like her mother. She's stubborn, has a harsh attitude, and acts selfish sometimes. Aegis core crystal or by the hair flip? This is Pyra and Rex's daughter. It was funny to see the man stumble when trying to connect with a daughter that doesn't know anything about families. I will say though, I was disappointed by the end with Glimmer and Nicole. Didn't contribute a lot in the story after their introduction. Coming from Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 comes the amazing protagonist of those games. Of course, they both got redesigned and they look so cool now. Shulk's design is heavily inspired by Dunben, with longer hair, an unusable right arm, and a similar outfit. And then there's Rex who, holy Jesus, he looks so good now. Bro is drip and he's wielding both of the Aegis swords. Jesus Christ, and that's not even it. He's also missing an eye. All these new design elements help to make Future Redeemed a joy to play, especially when you play these other games before and you see the other characters that, that Shulk and Rex got their inspirations from. 
In Future Redeemed, both Shulk and Rex are fighting together with the Liberators, a group that's teamed up at the original Colony 9 to find and to protect city folk spread out throughout the region. They're also both mentors to two future house leaders. Their introductions in the story are fantastic, and they reference so many things throughout the game, and it's such a treat to go through each affinity scene to see what the old dudes have to say about a landmark or a scene. While they don't contribute as much compared to Matthew and A, they're still very important characters and I love seeing them every second in this game. Besides, who wouldn't after seeing how busted Rex is? Numa, Logos, Antos. These are the three parts of the Trinity Processor. Numa is Mithra and Pyra, and Logos is Melos. When Xeoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition released, we found out that Alvis was indeed an Aegis, and it should have been a surprise. After the end of Xeoblade Chronicles, I never thought they would ever see Alvis again. I mean, the world survives without a god, and I believed that his role in the story was over. I was wrong. Alvis, or should I say Alpha, returns as a primary antagonist for Future Redeemed, and he isn't actually part of the Mobius's Endless Now. I already talked about his motivations beforehand, so let's just skip all that for right now. Before the events of Future Redeemed, Alvis split into two, and now Alpha is a heartless machine that doesn't care about the original worlds. Instead, he wishes only to save the city's inhabitants and to wash away the original world's people. This is why Alpha targeted Niel. Time and time again, Niall has experienced the same thing over and over again. She's been forced to see her friends killed and constantly fighting without end. She's sick of it and she's already lost a lot. She's a perfect host for Alpha and it's because they're compatible and perfect for each other. Overall, I'm not the biggest fan of Niall other than her design and personality because I feel like she's a lot of missed potential. In addition, she's not that great as a party member and I wish Monosoft did more with her in general. I wish that she got to be her own character outside of just being a host for Alpha. While Xeoblade 2's combat is still my preference, I think Future Redeemed handled the new systems the best and integrated them with the specials from Xenoblade 2 quite well, and the overall progression not being based on just leveling up, but rewarding you for exploring and fighting is so good and echoes the best parts of previous game's mechanics. The music in the base game was fantastic, with it striking the right amount of emotion, pain, and pure bliss. Songs like Carrying the Weight of Life, A Step Away, and Where We Belong were some of my favorites in the entire series. I love the entire Xenoblade Trilogy soundtrack, and 3 is currently my favorite in the series. The battle themes and the, and the game having dynamic music was good, but I'll be honest, the environmental songs were so underwhelming. They didn't have the same energy from Xenoblade 1 and 2, and it made me really, really sad. Environmental music was a huge reason why I loved the series, mainly because it was so unique and helped to make each step that you took feel like a grand adventure. That's why it was a huge but great surprise to see that Monolithsoft actually listened to the fans and made some actually good environmental themes. From the Black Mountains to Aurora Shelf, it was finally amazing to feel this grand scale of adventure with the proper environmental music that I wanted from the very start. We even got to see past songs return from Zane Blade Chronicles. We got Colony 9, Time to Fight, and, and Fog Beast Battle. I will say though that I wish they got remix, and overall the returning songs as being the originals, it's a lot of missed potential. I do guess that might be just me expecting more out of the game that already did a lot. If they did remix some previous songs, some that I would have loved to see would, would have been a new Chain Attack theme, you will recall our names final, and remix versions of the Xenoblade 1 songs. Regardless, each track is amazing and helps to connect the previous games together in yet another way. Also, I geeked out a lot in this one particular scene too, when they reference the names of music tracks from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. Our plane! Tomorrow with you! Bring it with Chaos Ultimate! All of them? All, All of them. them! If I must, from the top then. You're standing While I feel like it's impossible for me to like Future Redeemed more than the base game of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 itself, I still had a fantastic time with this. It introduced so much and it helped to put a lot of closure on a lot of things missing from the base game. While I do feel like there is some potential here and there, none of that matters. Xenoblade Chronicles has been a special franchise for me ever since I started it all the way back in 2020, and now, I'm finished. I'm finally finished with the franchise that started 13 years ago, and I'm finally finishing the epic storyline that started nearly 25 years ago with Xenogears. In my previous Xenoblade Chronicles 3 video, I said that Takahashi had finally fulfilled his lifelong dream of completing perfect works. Obviously, I was wrong. The entire story wasn't finished at that point, but now, 
The story Perfect Works is finally complete, thanks to the release of Future Redeemed. Thank you, Monolith Soft, for everything. Thank you, Xenoblade Chronicles, for being one of the best franchises ever. Thank you for meaning everything to me. I've seen that look before The stare of your fearful looking eyes That quite Matthew is out of here! Thank you.